Thank you very much, Simon, uh, and thanks to Peter as well. It's great to be here. We appreciate the organization of this conference and the, and the chance to speak with you and, and really to address this big question of, of you know, is this a moment of transformation? And we're delighted to have a chance to talk about some of the major themes from our book, which suggests, yes, we are in the midst of a major transformation. And uh, in fact, uh, that transformation, that moment of transformation has been going on now almost 20 years. 21st century for us uh, began not in 2001, not on 9-11, but in fact on the mirror image of that date, 11-9. November 9th, 1989 was the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was a mirror image date of 9-11 in more ways than one because unlike the, the tragedy of 9-11, of 11-9 was a, was a moment of, of celebration, uh, people dancing on the Berlin Wall. But while it signified the, Amer the, the, the defeat of communism, uh, the collapse of, of communist uh, rule all throughout Eastern Europe and then finally in the Soviet Union. And while it gave rise to this world of America as the, as the leading power in the world, uh, it also had other more unnoticed qualities. And that is giving rise to many of the uncertainties that we're dealing with today. And what we want to do is, I'm going to say a few words about some of the ideas about foreign policy. Derek's going to talk about the politics, but really to, to start a conversation of of where are we today and where are we going? And our, our goal is to give you some sense of how we got here and thus how to think about how to go forward. And probably from the standpoint of ideas, the most important thing when we think about 11-9 and what followed is that it put an end to what American foreign policy elites knew about foreign policy. For 40 years before 11-9, the elites in this town, Democrat and Republican, had been guided by a very simple notion about foreign policy, and that was one that had been created in the late 1940s by the famous diplomat George Kennan. The idea of containment of the Soviet Union, that would be America's purpose, that it would deal with this beast out there and, and work to contain Soviet power wherever it could. Well, of course, with 11-9 and then the collapse of communism, that was all irrelevant. And what would follow? And you had an incredible number of people in this town and outside this town who all wanted to be the next George Kennan. They were all going to come up with the next simple bumper sticker phrase that would explain American foreign policy and prescribe what to do about the world that we're living in. And you had, you had the, the, the outside pundits, you had people like Frank Fukuyama who talked about the end of history and Samuel Huntington with the clash of civilizations. And Robert Kaplan wrote about the coming anarchy. You had inside the government in the 1990s, there were people like Tony Lake who talked about democratic enlargement, expanding democracy, and Madeleine Albright, assertive multilateralism. And so all these phrases were all attempts to come up with some new way of of characterizing the world, but what we learned was uh, that none of these either explained enough or offered enough prescription for how to go forward. And the main reason why that was the case is that we're not living in the world we lived in before 11-9, where you could have a simple word, one single thing that would guide the entire foreign policy that we have and respond to the myriad of challenges that we have. In 1994, the Clinton administration, which was very eager to come up with a new phrase, they invited George Kennan down to Washington. He was 90 years old, living in Princeton, New Jersey. They invited him down to Washington and said, well, you know, we'd like to get your advice on how to create this new framework. And he said, well, my advice would be give up trying to come up with that one single word. Why don't you try coming up with a thoughtful paragraph or two? And that's the world we've been living in, where we need a thoughtful paragraph or two. 
It's too com the, the, the challenges we face are too complex. And if we didn't understand that in the years after 11-9, we should now understand that in the years after 9-11. Because the Bush administration critique of the Bill Clinton years was, these guys are too ad hoc, they're dealing with all these different problems, they don't have a single phrase. And with 9-11, they came up with theirs, war on terror. And that was going to solve all the problems of American foreign policy, focus and direction. Well, as we know, it didn't. It was an illusion that you could come up. It, I mean, it didn't help us even with dealing with just the problem of Islamic extremism, much less with all the other problems that Simon and Peter have already mentioned. And you even now have major architects of the policy, Donald Rumsfeld, Colin Powell, and others, who say it was a bad idea to try to come up with that single, single phrase. So one of the things that we try to argue in, in the book, and that we hope to leave you with here today, is don't expect, don't ask from your leaders to come up with some single phrase, single doctrine that's going to explain the world we live in. We have a myriad of problems from climate change and rising powers and failed states, ethnic conflict, nuclear proliferation, and so on. And we can have principles, and we should. We can have goals, and we should. But we're not going to solve these problems by looking for that elusive, simple answer the way we had during the Cold War. And with that, I'll turn it over to Derek to talk about the politics of the era. Yeah, as Jim touched on, um, the 11-9 era changed the debate about doctrine. It also changed the debate about politics and the, the politics of foreign policy. And in our book, we try to explore the interaction between the debates that policy wonks have about foreign policy and the political debates about foreign policy. And our contention is, is that one really can't understand the debates about politics after 9-11, the political debates about foreign policy, without thinking about the political debates of sort of the post-11-9 era. Because many of these debates we've all been having in Washington and around the country um, that have been exp exploded out into the open after 9-11 were debates that were simmering along and gestating after 11-9. And because in many ways, both conservatives and liberals use the end of the Cold War and 11-9 to redefine themselves. And, um, in, in one case with the conservatives, I think it was mo mainly a moment of crisis, and this is sort of built on what Simon was saying earlier about you know, the conservative sort of meltdown that we're seeing. Actually, I think this meltdown in many ways began with 11-9 because communism and anti-communism had been the glue that had held conservatives together uh, for the better part of 40 years. And after the fall of the wall and the end of the Cold War, conservatives began to splinter apart, and they broke into several groups. You had sort of the Bush 41, kind of realist internationalists who actually, oddly enough, believed, hoped that the UN system would finally be able to work, the system that FDR had created, that the great powers could come together and try to solve problems. This was the new world order that George H.W. Bush was talking about. Um, you had the Pat Buchanan conservatives. Pat Buchanan made a, made a run for president in 1992 and did pretty well, at least in the primaries. And this sort of more kind of nationalist, nativist conservatism that had really been kind of under the covers since the 1950s when Robert Taft had been the champion, this roared back in the early 90s and Pat Buchanan became a major force and those, those around him became a major force in the conservative debates. Then you had a somewhat similar vein with, with the congressional Republicans or what we in our book call the contract Republicans, those who came in in 1994 who had a more, not quite isolationist, but more of sort of a nationalist vein, very skeptical of international institutions, very skeptical of those like George H.W. Bush and the views of sort of supporting the United Nations. And then you saw a, a, a fourth group, which really almost died off after the end of the Cold War, but one that, that we've talked a lot about in this town over the past seven years, the neoconservatives. Those who had splintered off from the Democrats, actually, in the 1970s and 80s uh, over the fear that Democrats and liberals were, were not strong enough on communism. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, many neoconservatives said, hey, we've succeeded. Let's, you know, close up shop and, uh, you know, we've, we've mission accomplished. The Soviet Union's gone. Uh, and, you know, it, throughout the mid-90s and into the late 90s, neoconservatives were a pretty small band here in this town. They felt isolated from their own party, from the Republican Party, and they really didn't feel uh, much a part of the Democrats either. Um, but for the Democrats, the, the end of the Cold War also, for them, uh, created a moment, and rather a sort of crisis, it was almost a moment of what they hoped would be rebirth. Uh, there was obviously an initial concern um, at the Gulf War when Bush's approval ratings were at 91%, that the Democrats would sort of be shut out of office forever, but then soon they realized that the end of the Cold War provided a huge opportunity for them. And Bill Clinton himself 
told aides that during 1992 uh, that you know if had the Cold War not ended, he probably would have very little chance of being president. Um, so one view uh, that Democrats had, and that many in the Clinton administration had, is you know what we can finally reunify the party. The debates that had crippled us, the Democrats, since Vietnam, were finally over, and we could actually get the neoconservatives to come back into the party. In other words, those who believed in ideals, who believed in the promotion of democracy, could come back. And we actually describe a memo in our book that it was an internal campaign memo that was entitled, Winning Back the Neoconservatives, uh, that went to the high command of the Clinton campaign. And the idea was, again, we, these fights that had divided Democrats for many years were finally could be over with the Soviet Union being gone. The second, which was an idea that very much became associated with Clinton, it, uh, was this um, sense that the economy could, and the global economy was, could be more integrated into foreign policy. It was really kind of the embrace of globalization. Uh, and Clinton obviously very much believed in this and in many ways championed this throughout the 1990s, he, although he was always frustrated with the fact that he never really could think, believe that the American people um, would fully embrace it or that their anxieties could be alleviated about globalization. Part of this was his frustration about not being able to come up with a bumper sticker to talk about it, but also to try to kind of address the fears that many Americans had about the dislocations associated with globalization. But this, this idea was some, the idea of globalization and the embrace of it sort of at an intellectual level and the effort to try to make a, a sort of politically winning argument out of globalization was very much something that Democrats were associated with during this period. Um, but there was a, there was a sort of a, a contrary trend here too, particularly early in the 90s, and it's something that, that Democrats I, in many ways I think are still trying to live down, which was that uh, foreign policy maybe didn't matter as much. Um, now this particularly was, was a focus in the early 90s, and I think that, that uh, to be fair, many conservatives actually believed the same thing. In fact, we describe in our book, uh, in 19, at the end of 1993, Dick Cheney gives a major speech at AEI uh, which goes through the sort of usual routine criticisms of Clinton, uh, but what's very interesting about it is he criticizes those in the room sitting in front of him, fellow conservatives who say, you know, we have aided and abetted uh, the drift away from the focus on foreign policy. Dick Cheney, as many people have forgotten, actually, you know, contemplated a very seriously contemplated a run for president in 1996. At the time, actually, he was seen as the one person from the George Bush 41 administration who had the greatest chance of actually uh, being the Republican nominee in 96, he went to 48 states in 1994 and tried to sort of peddle this message of being a foreign policy president, didn't get anywhere. So uh, in early 1995, he left Washington for, uh, for Halliburton, in which he said at the time he was leaving politics forever, which is an indication of where conservatives were uh, at that time and the messages that were carrying there. Now, Clinton clearly had, uh, and Democrats clearly had early missteps in office, things we all know very well, the Rwanda and Bosnia and Haiti and Somalia. In many ways, these, these early missteps um, in their, uh, kind of framed the conservative uh, critique of Democrats generally on foreign policy. It relates to what Jim was mentioning earlier about the ad hocism, the sense the Democrats really couldn't do foreign policy very well. And even as Clinton gained confidence, and was able to actually uh, use force successfully in the Balkans. Uh, this kind of early critique that had been cemented in the 1993-94 period, which we cover in the book, uh, had sort of stuck in the minds of conservatives and they never really were able to overcome that. Um, and it really colored their perceptions of Democrats generally on foreign policy. And I think this very much explains sort of many of the Bush 43 administration's actions uh, when it took office in 2001, the sense that almost everything Clinton had done was tainted or unserious or somehow uh, weak. Uh, it was kind of a knee-jerk reaction that I think very much was, uh, was consistent with their views that had been formed by Clinton in the early 90s. But I think to be fair, as we uncover at the turn of the century, you know, in the year 2000, 2001, the Clinton administration and, and Democrats generally had come to a, to a fairly strong consensus on foreign policy. It was a consensus that was rooted in the promotion of democracy and this embrace of globalization and also a belief that military power could be used uh, effectively uh, to solve problems. Um, I think there's really no greater symbol of this consensus than the Democratic ticket in 2000. Al Gore, who at the time was really the, you know, one of the biggest hawks within the Clinton administration, and Joe Lieberman, um, and you know, it's a fairly remarkable just personal trajectory, you know, now that 
we all know where Lieberman is today, uh, and he's a top advisor to John McCain, but I think that that shows you I mean, where the Democrats were in the year 2000. And this consensus on these three issues, democracy promotion, uh, globalization, and the use of force, I think are the big challenges for sort of thinking about where the Democrats are moving forward. And that we've seen through the Bush years, for many reasons, I think, that the Democrats uh, on these three issues of democracy promotion and the use of force and on globalization, particularly on trade, this consensus is splintered. Uh, we see it on the campaign trail, we read about it in the political magazines and on the blogosphere, and it seems to me when, you're, when we're thinking about the post-Bush years moving forward, where Democrats and liberals come down on these issues will be absolutely critical to defining how they are gonna try to take advantage of this transformation. I think the similar case is, is true on the conservative side. Uh, obviously, uh, with, uh, you know, with the campaign in now and sort of where the conservative debate is going, um, there's, there are a lot of conservatives questioning whether or not democracy promotion could, should still be something that's part of the conservative agenda. Very much questioning the use of force, uh, you know, seeing where Iraq is right now. And uh, also conservatives, is a different sort of debate with globalization. Um, They've ne they never really came to grips with it, I think, in the, uh, in the 1990s, conservatives didn't. And I mean, in fact, just even the rhetoric of globalization was something that, that, the, that George Bush 43 and many of his aides never really uh, became comfortable with. I mean, some of, they saw it as sort of the Davos land, something that, that just wasn't part of their world. Um, obviously, I think that may manifest itself out a little bit in the immigration debates on the conservative side. Uh, so how conservatives grapple with, with those issues is really important. And then the, the last thing, which is kind of more about, uh, more of a cultural issue in terms of politics, is that throughout the 90s, throughout the period our book's about, there was always a sense that conservatives were kind of the default, you know, stewards of America's national security. That, that even, even for those of us who served in the Clinton administration uh, in foreign policy roles, you know, whatever we thought of Bush, when they came into office in, in 2001, we thought, all right, well, you know, we don't agree with this guy, but this is, these are pros, you know, I mean, Colin Powell and Rich Armitage and Wolfowitz and others, I mean, you know, these, they know what they're doing. Well, that, that sort of, that sort of veneer of, of kind of dominance on security is gone, completely gone. I think it's not unlike what liberals went through in the post-Vietnam years where the sort of best and the brightest generation was basically destroyed by Vietnam. And I, I, I foresee that conservatives have sort of lost confidence in themselves, not just in their ideas, but in their own competence. And that, to me, will be really interesting in how it sort of changes the political debate here in town uh, about foreign policy moving forward, because there will no longer be a sense that conservatives really know what they're doing on foreign policy. Um, now, I want to make a closing point, uh, and it's, it's, one, it's, one, it's a way we close our book, and it's, it's about Iraq, because I think how we think about this transformation in this moment and how we, see the, how we can seize the opportunities or avoid the pitfalls of this moment uh, is going to very much depend on, on, on foreign policy. It's very much going to depend on, on how Iraq is solved. And uh, in keeping with the theme that sort of things, not everything changed on 9-11, that I mean, I, we see Iraq as really a, a better part of a 20-year struggle. I mean, our entanglement with Iraq uh, really began in August of 1990 when Saddam invaded Kuwait. And uh, we are approaching uh, this January what we see as sort of the third Iraq handoff. George H.W. Bush handed Iraq off to Clinton, and it was, you know, an Iraq with a bunch of Security Council resolutions against it where we had, you know, no fly, we were patrolling no fly zones in the north and the south, and, you know, George Bush used force two days against Iraq two days before Clinton was inaugurated, and Clinton's first use of force was in June of 1993 against Iraq. Of course, fast forward eight years later, George Bush, or Bill, George Bush inherits an Iraq from Bill Clinton, um, one that they, a subject they actually discussed in their transition meeting in December of 2000 in the Oval Office where Clinton expressed regrets that Saddam was still around and that this was going to be a struggle that the Clinton administration was going to have to deal with. And then, of course, in this January, George Bush will hand off Iraq to a new president. Obviously, it's an Iraq that is in exponentially worse shape, uh, and our, our situation there is exponentially worse than it, it was in either 1993 or 2001, but nevertheless, it's, it's going to be an ongoing issue for us, and how we end it and solve it uh, will be critical to how we sort of t seize this transformational moment.